So it's like the bar has become very low to enter at a comparably good quality. So what you need to focus right now, I think, is A, find a niche and find be spot. Yeah, very, exactly. very good at things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the Changing Stage Show. My name is Florentino Buenaventura, and this is the Intertalk Media Network. And I've got two good friends here that I've met uh, from different production projects that we've been on. Actually, one pretty new one, so I'm going to try to get his name right. Uh, I've got Jorg Hutner, and that's Jorg with the O with the two the umlauts, the two dots. I always always want to make sure wherever we got he gets that, or with the E. You had to learn to do that because we did a video project with mm-hmm. Jorg here, and Matt Salazar. And Matt Salazar and Jorg are both accomplished songwriters, um, audio engineers, sound designers, and they are also composers for film and video and sync licensing and all this other fun stuff. And that's what we're going to talk about today. This is all about how do you get into this business of making music for video, whether it be a TV show, a film, commercials little snippets inside MTV shows, whatever it's going to be. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to have Jorg start off here uh-huh. and tell us a little bit about himself. Jorg, tell me, how did you know? How did you get started in music? Uh, and then how did you kind of move your way into uh, creating and sound designing and making music for video and television uh-huh. and film? Well, this started actually, um, I got interested in electronic music when I was about nine years old. Okay. I bought my first Depeche Mode record back then, <laughs> at a very <laughs> early age. <laughs> That's and, awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you uh, they just came by, didn't they? Not too long ago? Uh, possible, yeah, yeah. Uh, I unfortunately didn't go to the uh, last concert, not because I don't like them. It's just like it didn't work out. But uh, so, yeah, bought the first uh, 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 record of them at nine and was interested in other electronic acts back then, like Shami Jajar, which was a huge uh, instrumental uh, composer. Yeah. We've talked about him. Uh, He's the one who did the big concert. In yeah, yeah. And he had a very famous film composer father, which was yeah. Maurice Jajar. And uh, then and also like other 80s bands that were very electronic heavy like Kaja Gugu, ABC and that kind of stuff. And uh, then uh, after saving quite a little bit of money, I actually purchased my first synthesizer when I was 15 years old and started with bands and my friend's first band project at the age of 17. Yeah. And I finished high school in Germany at 19. And right after that, after a three months break, went straight into actually the music industry. Started as an intern in a recording studio. This was actually the studio of uh, uh, the boss of a label I was signed to with the band. That's how the, that contact came. And basically learned there literally from you know besides cooking coffee and like you know uh, cleaning the studio. Yeah. Also, I was literally sitting behind a desk within two three months, which was not usual actually. And uh, just, you know, learned the basics over that time and then over the course of time actually got into the music instrument and software industry as a, a product specialist and sound designer for Waldorf Electronics and yeah, great, great. Uh, basically a, an yeah. instrument uh, distributor in Germany that also yeah. did like access virus and like Novation back then in, in yeah. Europe and all this kind of stuff. And so. you, we're going to give a shout out to our mutual friends of ours, Arturia. Yeah. We use a lot of their gear. Mm-hmm. Matrix Brew. Who, who does it at this point? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? <laughs> you know? this, yeah. I mean, if really. If you want to play synth stuff, you want to do sound yeah. design, it's <clears throat> Arturia. Mm-hmm. And then, what was the one, the big modular synth that you had there? Well, this is a good, this is like a combination of different brands, basically. I uh, built together a Eurorack style uh, uh, modular synthesizer or so Eurorack format, different? basically. Yeah, it's not just one manufacturer. The cases are just by, all by one wow. uh, German manufacturer, Döpfer, and I have a lot of their modules Amazing as well. You learn when you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was just one manufacturer no, no. when we went there. No, no, oh. it was all kinds. Of, and yeah. then the different modules you can get in the meantime from like this entire market exploded over the last. Yeah, three yeah. to four years yeah, yeah. and uh, so I have like literally modules from different manufacturers I would say like you know 40% is like Dupfer modules uh, Dupfer is the actual German manufacturer that de- designed the Eurorack format so the, the length and the width and all this for these uh, modules 
And but I have I think like we're gonna put some pictures of that up here shortly. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That is. And I have like you know all kinds of different manufacturers in there. So I kind of like was looking for specific modules, and not just from a different one brand, but yeah. like from different manufacturers. I was looking for specific stuff, and so it just you know I have from modules from Germany, from France, from England, from America. It doesn't really matter. Oh, it's like all awesome. over the place. That module actually changed the way working with York changed the way I recorded guitar because I started thinking more outside of the box. And if you come down to the studio, you'll see our guitar wall, oh, really? which is. Make it down there, man. More like a modular synthesizer <laughs> for a guitar, you know. But it's really working you just with your. You patch together like one. Of Basically, yeah, I'm blending tones just to make something new, you know. But that was all pretty much inspired by sitting in the studio for you know hours and hours on end watching what I'm like. Yeah, that, we should be doing this with a guitar. It's not just synthesis, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. So, um, how did you get into the sound designing and more important soundtracks? Oh, uh, 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 Girl on a Train, Independence Day, the last one that mm -hmm. came out. These are. Movies that you've worked on, right? Yeah, 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 totally. Well, this this started literally with my um, um, with the work for the music instrument yeah, industry yeah, for yeah. all these synthesizers. So when I did a lot of sound design for these synthesizers, the factory sound design, so you got them already with sounds uh, that I, I yeah. did back then. Um, uh, composers actually here in LA uh, were German composers got uh, interested in 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 more stuff that I did because yeah. they were constantly uh, using my sounds. Funnily, it was actually Ramin Javadi uh, back then, who's now doing all the Game of Thrones and all that kind of stuff. Oh, huge and uh, uh, Klaus Badl was the other one. I'm not sure what he's actually doing right now. And um, those got in touch with me first. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then also for my work for Waldorf at the NAMM show here, because I came over like from 98 on every mm -hmm. January, February so for the NAMM show. Work with Waldorf? Is that no, 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 actually no. a long time. No, no. Uh, I stopped like in 2003 or something okay. like that. But it was back That's then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like yesterday, but it's like oh, yeah. 15 years. Oh. Go, right? It's <laughs> time, <laughs> crazy. time flies, yeah, yeah. especially in this industry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it does, right? Yeah, it's it's just, one long session. Yeah, uh, it, it just seems like yesterday we we're hanging out at a studio, but it's what, almost going on a month now, right? Yeah. Uh, probably longer. Yeah, it's yeah. like I don't don't quote me on this, but it might be longer than a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, so um, through that, I actually then also got in touch with Hans Simmer, who back then was actually also a fan yeah. of the Waldorf synthesizers and whatnot, and I just kept in contact with that. Crew, yeah. uh, they were based in Santa Monica. I feel bad we don't have a synthesizer in the musical representation. Uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> we got some uh, soundscapes going in the back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just well, playing some yeah, stuff yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so anyway, that's how the, the actual connection came, and I met them every time I flew to LA because I came over twice a year. Yeah. What, in the in, in the early of the year for the Nam show, and yeah. then in summer to meet friends that I made on, on tours in Europe yeah. back in the day, Americans, and always stayed with them, and obviously yeah. went to the beach and tried to make as much contacts as possible until the first job actually came in 2004 uh, which was Catwoman the movie was not that great but the <laughs> music production was but Holly Berry fun. looked damn fine in oh, the no, movie no no no, <laughs> no, 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 no that, I mean excuse hey. me she's a she's a gorgeous gorgeous <laughs> but woman. yeah you're right it definitely wasn't one of the better super, no, superhero absolutely. movies no no <laughs> but the, the music production was actually fun and yeah. then uh, half a year later uh, I worked on The Ring 2 the second oh, yeah. uh, 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 The Ring and that's the first time when I worked for the Swiss cellist Martin Tillman. Yeah, yeah. And then right after that, they actually called me to come over to London where they did Batman Begins back then. Okay. And that's when I had all the references and stuff together to actually apply for U.S. work permit. And then it took an, quite a while longer. And in March 2007, I finally was able to move over. Very cool. So and, and, and right there, I, I had already the contact. So I was basically just like now knocking you, a gun on the doors and now? went in. Well, yeah, for the most part, yeah. yeah. That's how it started, basically. Very cool. And you brought one of your partners in crime here, Matt. Yeah. So, Matt, Matt Salazar, you actually own a studio, and you own one of the, my favorite consoles of all time, you know, uh -huh. SSL. Um, tell us about yourself. Tell us how you got into this crazy business, how you, you know, owning a studio in this day and age when everyone wants to have a studio in their house. Sure. And how that's flourishing, and then kind of how you got into sound designs, sync licensing, all the other fun stuff. Sure. Yeah, I, I started my interest in recording as a teenager, you know, so I started recording a lot of local bands and things like that, and you'd get, you know, on the local radio shows, yeah, yeah. you know, and that, you know, sparks your interest, right? So out of high school, I just moved down to L.A. and started scrubbing toilets, you know? I think I had internships at three studios at a time. Toilet yeah, know. you know, that's the way, if, if you can't scrub toilets, you can't make records, you know? You know what, though? That's true. That's how Sonny... From Sonny and Cher, got his start. He was 
you know, doing that. And the next thing you know, he's got Phil Spector saying, hey, can you come sing this part? Yeah, there you go. You know, it makes you humble. Just, yeah, you know, yeah. If you, you know. Keeps if you, you real. Yeah, Keeps totally. You real. I, I was lucky because I was only 18 when I came to L.A. I couldn't be a runner. Where were you from again? Uh, Fresno, California, Central Valley. Sacramento, dude. Oh, okay, there you no go. Cow. Yeah. Hella. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to keep that to a minimum. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I wasn't able to work the normal roles, or I guess yeah. you could say. So I was... I'd just do anything, right? Yeah. And I ended up working uh, at a studio called O'Henry, which yeah. was a really nice studio in Burbank. They closed probably 15 years ago at this point. but um, Or I should say went private. The studio's still there. It's some, yeah. some sort of private. A lot of them are going private, it seems like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. people, you know. Um, anyway, I, I was, like, working nights there, basically. So I'd kind of do my internships during the day, and I got, like, a... I was kind of like the night guy at the, at the kind of, like, the front desk. Yeah. but. A lot of the, maybe it was just because I was a young kid and, you know, whatever, I got, I was talking to a lot of the producers and stuff. They said, look, you know, what you really need to do is just start producing bands now. You know, don't, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter, you know, you know, but just you've already started, you know, because I'd ask for critiques, what yeah. stuff I'd done. And the first group I produced got some traction. We did it in the garage. The, the night tech was like sneaking out equipment for me to use in this garage. <laughs> and um, one of the producers that would work there gave me the name of a guy named Freddie Puro who owned Ocean Studios Burbank. Okay. Said, go over there, go talk to this guy. He'll help you out. Yeah. And he ended up managing me. So I went from kind of intern. Now, was this Ocean Way or Ocean Studios? Ocean Studios in Burbank. They're still there. Different okay. owner. and okay. Yeah. It's a big 80 series Neve console. Cool studio. Regardless, oh, wow. still to this day, great studio. Okay. I'll interrupt you here. Neve or SSL? You got the SSL, but I, I people go back and forth. It's always been. Yeah, I've um, for tracking. I used to track on quite a bit of Neves. Now I have. There's a company, um, Jeff Steiger. He actually moved to Nashville now, but Cap Electronics. Okay. He's got preamps, and I merged those with some vintage API 550 AEQs. Wow. That's my favorite front end. I, I we have the studio's got racks of Neves. I, I don't really use them that much anymore. Yeah. You know, I like the like yeah, the yeah. Cappies, and um, but for mixing. Um, which is what I do most now. Yeah. SSL is like you can't the crunch you get from it. And everything is just it is, so it it's is. just great. But I, the APIs were always. Uh, I did a lot of production back in the eighties. Okay. So, um, but anyway, I, I'm sorry. I started geeking out there for a second. So continue on. Uh, we can keep geeking out. Yeah. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is why we even do anything is so we can get gear, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's for you know. Um, hey, I'm with you. Anyway, so I started. He immediately he had a publishing catalog. And okay. the first thing he had me do was start, uh, this is when the, everything was on 24-track tape. Pro yeah. Tools wasn't even kind of included in studios. You had to rent it. Yeah, yeah. Um, which led me to buying my first Pro Tools rig because I was able to rent it to the studio. Yeah. You know, start to become an entrepreneur. That's what you have to be in this business, right? So, I, yeah. you know, coming from there and tracking, I did a lot of development, got a lot of bands signed to major record deals. Um, but The Rock, you know, early 2000s kind of rock. Yeah. What were some who are some of the bands? Um, the bands that I would work with initially, they're, they're, no, they're not really bands that really, I guess, popped off, you know? But at the time, everyone's getting quarter million dollar advances, so it was great. But uh, band, yeah, Those are the days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah there was a band uh, on Interscope uh, called Depswa. Okay. A uh, band called Neural that I think ended up on Atlantic. Um, a lot of these guys ended up playing in pop acts. So they're like metal bands, you know, but now I think um, the guitarist for one of the groups is playing for Kesha now. Okay. You know, um, yeah, my friend Tommy plays for uh, Adam Lambert. You know, it's, yeah. it's funny that, you know, that's... They kind of go that side. Yeah. The reverse happened with the guy from uh, um, Five Finger Death Punch. He started uh-huh. off with, uh, what was her name? Uh, oh, God, what was her name? Uh, Lizzie McGuire girl, I can't remember. She oh, was, hey, you um, know. yeah. You know, we, we know who we're talking about. Yeah. So he was playing with her, and then he actually ended up at Death Cab, or, 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 or Five Finger Death Punch. Yeah. So it's a great band. Yeah, they, they are. They're, yeah. They're, they're doing really well. Not many bands can go out and do stadiums anymore. And they're doing it, that. Well, it's surprising that you know you don't hear about it a lot because it's all about you know anytime you open a magazine, hip hop or whatever is dominating, yeah. and you go and you see the festivals and everything that these rock artists are doing. Yeah, yeah. And it's all under the rug, but I mean, it's still. You, you can't kill rock. No, yeah, no, you can't no. kill it. Yeah. No, we've got some good hope. But, you know, some people move into the world of making soundtracks and yeah. scoring. How did that happen for you? Well, yeah, for, for me, um, I started getting interest in film when I when I saw that you could license things and that how yeah, that yeah. could actually give you, you know, we weren't making, people weren't paying the production advances to make records, or yeah, especially yeah. rock records anymore. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the bands I was working with had gotten this licensing deal, and a, a check for eighteen thousand dollars showed up. And I, for me, I was like, "What? How did this happen?" You know. 
Um, and he got really interested in that. You know, mm-hmm. moved into really getting interested in scoring and working with orchestras, opening the scoring stage, and all the craziness that went th- with that. Um, when we getting the itch to want to go back and work with artists, mm-hmm. and knowing that you know the majority of, especially we have our catalogs very edgy. You know, yeah. it's not all rock. You know, Jorg has stuff in there, and he's yeah. very edgy electronically, but. Knowing that I wanted to make the records the way I was kind of raised to make them, you know, mm-hmm. working in the big studios, and this is how you do production, right, for yeah. these records. Um, and the only way to really do that is to monetize a catalog. Yeah. Because we can't do it with Spotify streams, you know, and we tried different avenues, and it just, it, it didn't, the numbers don't add up. If you want to have an SSL console in a studio and work with any band you want to work with and not have to be rushed by the clock, you yeah. know? So we block out our studio time and we're able to do what we want and make the records we want to make. And that's how we sell the artists, right? Because mm-hmm. we can't, you know, we're not universal. We can't come with some huge advance. You know, ours is, we come from the creative, right? Very that's cool. what we're, that's our sell, right? And, and so you're actually taking the bands with the sync licensing and, and kind of putting that together. That's very cool. Exactly. Yeah, we're developing. So um, Lucas Flood, he A&Rs, he listens to songs. You know, we have a, the weekly songwriter event, Writer's Block in Hollywood, and that's driving all kinds of songwriters. We're working with ASCAP. They're sending us stuff over. So we're getting first look at a lot of right. songs. And Lucas will bring in what he likes and play them, and we develop them. Well, that's, let's kind of jump into it then, guys. That's what this show is all about, is about uh, seeing what this industry is like. What we're told and what you guys can expand upon and mm. uh, expound upon is, is this where the money is at in the business? And how do people get into this arena? Um, and is it going to be over flooded? So let's start off with, what was it like? Because you've been doing this since yeah, yeah. 2004. How long have you been doing licensing? Licensing specifically, um, in flight music group started in 2011, oh, 2011. specifically for. And yeah. how about soundtrack stuff? Um, before that, a couple years before that, okay. yeah. So, what what was the dynamic like then, and and how has it changed? Is it do you feel it's better now, or what? What do you think is what do you think is this, you know the the, the transition been? I mean, on, from a business perspective, to be honest, I, it's a little bit hard for me to answer this out of a very simple reason because I kind of like worked myself up in the ranks. Got it. I mean, I, I, there were some projects I got hired to do synth programming for film and whatnot. That's interesting. Right That's to picture, interesting. sometimes not to picture and yeah. just doing sounds and whatnot. Uh, and then uh, there were even projects where I was literally working as an assistant to the film composer, uh, which gave me basically the entire knowledge of Everything that had to do with the entire process, uh, including like when to ship what and, you know, how to prepare orchestra recordings, how to prepare the final mix and all this kind of stuff. And uh, but less on the business side in that end. This came then uh, later on, obviously, you know, the more I got up in the ranks and whatnot, because like a lot of these synth programming jobs were like work for hire. So there's a set rate, you know, bid by day, by week Mm -hmm. or just a fixed amount, hey, that amount of dollars, whatnot. And um, then, obviously, uh, over time, uh, when I did also additional music writing and whatnot, that's when cue sheets came in, and mm-hmm. when I basically was also like uh, 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 participating on the back end, yeah, if it, yeah. you know, if there was something of interest coming there. That's when this actually came out. But this is still comparably new, I should say. This is a couple of years old now. Because okay. at the same time, I also started actually working uh, uh, on music for production library companies. Okay. And also trailers, which is also more on the back end these days with yeah. ASCAP or BMI, depending on which you know the society you're with. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this built up over time, and and literally like was like a, a slow ramp, and is now actually at a good and constant income. So problem for me is like, I couldn't tell you exactly how it was already in 2004 because yeah, yeah. these were for the most part back yeah, then it was like like that was literally like work for hire gigs. Yeah, were, yeah. This just later on came where the back end became more of uh, interest yeah. and whatnot. And also, like, when I focused more on this, basically. But these days, especially right now, there's obviously a lot of media content that is, uh, uh, you know, asked for in all kinds of different arenas, be it video games, especially, obviously, television right now, um, because that's exploding with all these big players pouring literally billions into that. And, and then, yeah, and, and then, obviously, like uh, the film composition, because yeah. the overall budgets for films actually came down for the most part. For the also, like side? for the for for uh, the composition end. On the other hand, there is more media to be placed through production library companies or yeah. other companies. Yeah, to I, do I think songs that's where your question like is almost like so a trick like, question because is, when is. you look at, let's say, Jorg, mm-hmm. when you say is it is the market oversaturated or yeah, there's a there's more people than ever trying to do this, but mm. Jorg is going to be you can't take what's in his head 
yeah. right? So when you're talking about original score and and working on films, right? Not yeah. not placement or syncing, right? But John Williams original. will always have a gig, right? Exactly, and that's where where your comes in. He you can't recreate what he does, you know. Um, and then on, you know, as far as you know, to support ancillary income, that's where, you know, your can sit down. And if, if he's not on a gig, right, yeah. of course, he's going to be sitting there building trailers and everything else. That's an ancillary income stream, you know. Yeah. Um, and that, and that, no matter who you are, whether it's Yorg or it's some kid at home, can yeah. enter that market. If they're good, then they have a chance. But, yes, it is it is a saturated market. I, I think he kind of alluded to something, though, that was interesting. The budgets from the films for soundtracks have kind of went down, but the budgets for films have increased. And those are kind of interesting dynamics, at least for me, to find out. Because I know, like, we were just talking about this. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think anybody's getting a uh, $250,000 advance, especially anybody new. Not that I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's just or, there's, no, there's no budget. For, or the deals. Right. Are, back with regular. Yeah, yeah. Because that's banding, just what it used to cost band. to make records, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what it was. Yeah, besides deals being completely different right now. Yeah. I mean, uh, less on my end, but like most of the bands these days basically sign 360 deals. Yeah, yeah. They do that. Oh, we, we had a that, songwriter yeah. we worked with who went on um, to sign with Universal and her advance was $20,000. Yeah, wow. uh, and I was like, you know, we're one license can make you more. You know, what do you? Yeah. I don't know what you're doing, but you know, some people have a dream. You know, that's what yeah, they yeah. came to do, and and that's yeah. great. You know, and but making your first money in that business can feel extremely wild and going like, yeah, I yeah. made it. It feels like something, well, sure. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and when you're 20 years for, old, sure. Oh, you know, yeah, for, yeah. for a lot of these songwriters, artists, that is a big part of the excitement, and they're yeah. not necessarily looking at the bigger picture like what mm-hmm. you guys are talking about. So let's kind of jump into that, Matt. You work a lot with these artists and with this industry. It does seem like the average musician has the chance to get their music on TV or in some type of video production, even for the online stuff. Like the guys from Complex are doing those, uh, they're doing videos like uh, we, Hot Ones. We, we did them. Yeah, oh. they, they come to our studio. Yeah, they work with us. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. We'll give so. them a shout out. Hey, Complex. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm, I'm big, keep keep big coming fans. back. The Hot Ones show is great, man. Yeah. I, just, I love that one. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so. Is that expanding the opportunities? How does that play out for the average musician right now? Right. I think it's a complex, actually, question because, like I said, anyone in their home can get into it. And there's a lot of production libraries that have, you know, 30,000 or more. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we combat at In Flight Music Group is, you know, there's these non exclusive libraries. And I think there's a little bit of brainwashing that's gone on with musicians where they'll take their song and they'll want to put it on Spotify and they'll give it to all these non-exclusive libraries, not understanding like what retitling is. And and I don't want to like, you know, ruin the show by going into all the, you know, legalese of this stuff, but it really hurts the artists in the long run and kind of what you are saying contributes to the oversaturization. Um, And it also makes it really hard on the soups and to know like if you have like say a retitled song, like who actually gets paid, right? And are are we going to have some sort of problem? are kind of forming our company more like a, almost like a label would be in the 60s right saying this is our niche market it's small but you know we have like what's called one stop right yeah. which means we have the master side the publishing side it's simple for the music soup that is while the market is really saturated there's a lot of stuff it's not actually that simple right so soups are getting more and more frustrated we've had a lot of meetings with soups that just won't go to the large libraries anymore because it's they never yeah, know what they're going to get it's it's kind much. of yeah, exactly yeah. Right, so while it is, and, and certainly anyone can get in the game, you know, yeah. um, it's becoming more what you are kind of alluded to initially with the influx of cash coming for the Netflix, Amazon, yeah. Hulu's. You know, I think for the first yeah. time they had a over, uh, it was like, I think they got almost a billion dollars of uh, production budget. That was like maybe f- three years ago now. They became a major, major entity. They could start buying in pilots, things like that. Initially, if you go back and watch those shows, you're going to hear the cheesiest music ever yeah. because they just yeah, right. couldn't afford to, you know, call it, you know, whether either they can, can afford the the bigger license that they really wanted, yeah. right, or they had to deal with too many people. And, you know, as Jorg knows, a lot of times, whether it's a show or a film, they might be down to the wire. They need that license and then it's going to go, yeah. right? Yeah. So if they have to deal with calling six different publishers for all the writers and, you know, dealing with a record label and, you know, everyone wants the same cut, right? Most favorite yeah. nations, right? Yeah. And, you know, this guy wants more, this guy, it, it, it's a hassle and there's just, everything's content right now, right? So it's not just like, okay, we have this one big show and that's what, you know, it's like, no, we have hundreds or more whatever shows, right, that all need something. Yeah. So, um, and licenses vary, you know, some licenses are, 
kind of short on cash up front, but you might see a lot on the back end, you yeah. know, or some are, you know, just depending on where the, where the, what the medium is, right, where it's going to end up on. But to get back to, yeah, there's opportunity for everyone, and, but it's not a, one, oh, let's just put it out there, right? You still have to be, and I think that's what it was previous, where publishing was kind of like the bastard stepchild, mm-hmm. you know, of making, let's say, records, you yeah. know, pop music. And now it's it's like a mainstay, right? It's a big deal, yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, it's you have to be methodical about it if you want to get in the game. You can't just say I'll give all these people or all these li- libraries my music and and we'll shotgun approach it. You know that's gone. That's well, not happening. Yeah, a lot of people. That, that's the mentality. Is I put it out everywhere, and someone's going to find it. And that's just, gone. Yeah, yeah there's, don't. There's, that's not going to happen. Yeah, that's what I that's what I've heard. Right. And, mm. But I think that a lot of people look at it that that's the way to go. It's, there's still a lot of people that think, oh, they're going to get a major label deal and they're going to get signed mm-hmm. from the other end. In this particular case, they get on some libraries and then they are going to get a, uh, a huge... This uh, is a lot of mis- yeah. misinformation, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Unfortunately for the artist. Yeah. So I got a question for you, York. Mm-hmm. So and, and I, we want, you know, we're going to talk a little bit from the more advanced levels, but this first part, I kind of want to design it around people who are just getting into it. If York started today... Mm-hmm. What would you tell Jorg with the stuff that you know now? How would you get yourself into the to the position that you're at? And you know, how long do you think you'd take you? Just it was speculation. Oh, converses before what oh you God. did. <laughs> well, this is like and here's a funny thing. Obviously, like you know, it's like in in, in your twenties, you're obviously the grown up, and you know yeah. so much about everything. And it <laughs> turns out, it. ten years later, you go like, oh, it's so dumb. And it's just like it's like, well. I, I worked with a lot of people at the very beginning of bands where like a lot of people went, yeah, we'll become professionals and whatnot. Yeah. Whenever you came to actually work in the studios, they were out partying and God knows what. Yeah, yeah. It was me and the bass player were not working on the stuff. So it's like, um, I, it's hard to develop an eye for something like that when you're young. Yeah. Y- you will run into traps like that. So there's just nothing that I could really correct per se because you wouldn't see it at that age anyway. What I would do, however, is like I would probably try to force myself to stay in my piano lessons when I was younger because uh. I stopped there. So you would not hire me as a pianist in a hotel bar. <laughs> Absolutely not. But He says piano, that, but he's actually a great pianist. So that tells you the level that you would need to be, right? Yeah. Not, well, not in LA, sorry. But yeah. there's like the talent here is just insane however having said that so i would would try to continue there and probably like uh you know take a little bit more of my holiday time and whatnot and probably even focus even more on 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 music and and production like that but in terms of like what would i in general would have made different it's literally the problem is that these mistakes that you made when you were younger you could not really correct because you wouldn't see yeah. it at that age. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Especially or like you working make a different one. with people. You know? like, yeah, yeah, totally. Or you make different ones. But if I would have to start these days right now, I think, because um, my start was actually pretty good. I specialized kind of like in the synthesizer world. Yeah. That opened me the doors to the yeah. film industry, to these big film composers and whatnot. A, you know, designer and totally, because I was, I was thing. like yeah. literally on a specialist uh, uh, kind of like lane. Mm-hmm. And that actually also allowed me to get the, the, the work permit. Yeah, because usually a lot of people will try to be as broad as possible again no kind of like I think that's a big mistake no, yeah, that is. no you I was literally like very specialized because yeah. I was so inter- interested in electronic music at an early age that like you know all this classical thing with piano and God knows it. <laughs> F that and whatnot. It, that was just my mindset yeah, yeah. in my teens and uh, you know but it, that's like find a niche you yeah. need to you find a niche that's obviously the difficult thing these days and uh, um, if I would start right now how long would it take that's a very very good question because I mean there's a lot of talent out there and obviously the bar to, to go yeah. into that business has become lower in the sense of like you buy a $1,500 Apple laptop and you get already garage band with it yeah, yeah. that's a software that can do more than pretty much all the thousands of dollars yeah, of yeah. hardware that I had at, at the, uh, not very much yeah. but like the hardware that I had back then I, there was I didn't have a 24 yeah. track tape machine or something like yeah. that yeah. garage band that's like yeah, yeah whatever just, just do it, do you it. Know? Just come so it's like we, you can computers. have like a, a $1,500 setup that's probably even including an audio interface that's yeah. decent and get a guitar for like $500 and like a little microphone and you probably can do already like demos of the quality that 20 years ago were absolutely yeah Oh yeah, I mean, Ima- demos unimaginable. Yeah, yeah. So it's like the bar has become very low to enter at a comparably good quality. So what you need to focus right now, I think, is a find a niche, 
and be yeah, very, exactly. very good at things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether it is like, you know, if you play a, a, an instrument, continue that because a general musical uh, education will help you along the way. Yeah, yeah. Whether you want to become a soloist or not is absolutely of no interest, but a good musical education can help. It's not totally needed. I also, for instance, went never to college because at the time I finished high school, yeah, with you know, you know there's like there was nothing that I could really study yeah. outside of classical engineering for orchestras yeah. and stuff like that. There was no really like what was available already in the U.S. with like pop music production and whatnot. Yeah. It was absolutely not there. So I went through the ranks of like as an intern. I worked my way up as learning by doing, yeah. and that that also gave me a good perspective on things. So also like keep your bar of what you think you might be able to request low be humble because like there's so many good people out there try you know don't go overboard so i mean but overall i think there's not too much that i could have changed in my path besides probably be even more focused on, yeah, on, on my focus. career passion but, commitment focus yeah focus is totally. the, the hardest part of that so yeah. that for success yeah. so matt now you some you know you got the you know the, the young York now. He comes to you. You've got some you got some uh, meetups and a bunch of other things that you're doing that kind of helps to foster those uh, those fledgling you know twenty somethings yeah. that are coming out. So tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, really, that's part of what we do, right? Developing and getting people who in, in your kind of hit on something earlier where he mentioned, you know, everyone wants to do this, right? But when the kind of rubber hits the road, they don't want to do it, yeah. you know, because this job is the hardest job ever, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot easier ways to support yourself than this business, as I'm sure we all know, right? Yeah. So, you know, we and we've had that issue. You know, a lot of times when you're dealing with a band, you know, then you'll have the drummer who enjoy. We have a brewery, right? Down like it, we're in, in our in our studio. You're so. a smart man. Yeah. <laughs> a studio next to a brewery. Yeah. The business is going to be flowing. Yeah. I, I can tell <laughs> right now. <laughs> So, you know, you, you always see who in the band is want to be in the studio and they de they never want to leave, right? They want to be creative and the guys who just are along for the ride and they're yeah. at the brewery playing video games, you know? Um, but that's part of it is, is knowing how to cherry pick that because yeah. there's, you know, there's a lot of people writing great songs right now, you know? Yeah. Um, but it, unfortunately, that means nothing, you know? And, and we'd like to think as creators, you know, because you know how it is to come up with something and you, you feel empowered by it. Yeah. Um, but there's so much more to it now, right? Yeah. And that's kind of where we come in, where we want to take the songs where they need mm -hmm. to go and, and actually be able to monetize them so these musicians can support themselves. Yeah. But again, it's not always that easy, you yeah. know, because it does require a lot of effort on the musician's part. Um, even when we're talking with soups, they, they want to see traction, right? So if you think from a music supervisor, they, they want to play radio DJ, kind of like in yeah. the past, right? They yeah. want to know, like, is this band going to do something? So if we could send something to them that maybe is a great track and, and maybe it might work but if they don't feel there's like something or some reason behind it it, it makes the band a lot less interesting yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of bands you know sometimes they'll just want to record but they don't want to handle like the social stuff and yeah. we have a guy uh, Zephan who works with those bands and he builds a whole plan for them to try to help them but you know you can't go out there and do it for them right yeah, yeah. so there's so much more than just being a musician so that's part of it you have to come and you have to be a niche and really know what you're doing and fit into especially when you're licensing yeah. they want something specific they don't want like a oh that's kind of pop they want something specific that's going to fit right exactly. so niche and then knowing that it's more work than just sitting down in your living room and writing songs yeah. it's a lot of work and probably a lot of stuff you don't want to do I know I don't want to do as a musician <laughs> but you're just going to have to you know grind your teeth and do it yeah, you know? exactly. so tell us um, we're going to give a plug for the two programs that you have right now where the meetups that you mentioned one of them yeah so we have um, Writer's Block at Black Rabbit Rose it's every Tuesday starts and at 8 o'clock this is in LA folks if you're not already aware oh, we're here yes, in LA right now no, yeah. or Pasadena specifically shout out to Summit uh, Rehearsal here where we're using one of their beautiful rooms that they have for rehearsals for this uh, they are nice. episode yeah they are right yeah, yeah. so so Writer's Block um, our A&R Lucas yeah. Flood uh, yeah. throws that it's very curated um, so he you know he puts the songwriters on stage. There's four or five songwriters a night every yeah. Tuesday on Hollywood Boulevard, Black Rabbit Rose, and then starting in October um, is the Rockers Ball. Okay. So where this one is more songwriter oriented, we try to uh, get co-writes going. It's really like communal yeah. based, and we have Building them and the they can yeah. exactly they go on stage and test the songs. Um, and Rockers Ball is more band based, so we okay. can get more artists kind of involved in the local rock scene. It's kind of so spread out and. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's starting in October. Luke's is, is putting together right now. And for your recording studio, I was <clears throat> floored by the pricing that's on the website. Oh, thank you. So 65 bucks an hour, is that correct? That starts, we do a lot of production dates, yeah. yeah. So they come in and, and they'll we, we allow people to come in kind of after hours yeah, and yeah. just sit there and produce music, yeah. So what I remember back in the 80s, I'm giving my age away, guys, when I was doing production using SSL rooms, if you got a great room like Skip Sailors, I guess it's, it's probably Skip is gone now, or um, Larrabee's and mm-hmm. stuff like that, the average rate in the '80s for a SSL room was, if you got the overnights, two seventy-five. Sure. If you're lucky. Mm-hmm. Four fifty. Oh yeah. If you were like, you paid card rate, which sixty-five bucks an hour, man. And those yeah. costs still. Are yeah, we, that's obviously it's for the musician, the young musicians. You know, we we do label projects and that you know, but it's it's it, it's to allow people to get involved yeah. again with us as a company. And we've had people come in that have now start working on on catalog for us, yeah, you know. Yeah. So it's like, why don't you just not pay us any money, and you still get to sit in the studio and just build catalog? Yeah, yeah, so no, that's, that's pretty nice. it's for us. We're trying to build community yeah. around this and and target kind of young musicians getting in, yeah. <clears throat> combat that misinformation, right? And that's yeah. that's part of what we do. So, with that said, let's kind of talk about obstacles. What do you, with the dynamics of the industry, what are the challenges that the industry faces now with Technology with community with um, opportunities with the internet piece and how that plays out with royalties. What are some of the challenges that you guys see that, that the industry is facing, and uh, what are some of the thoughts on how you know people should tackle this? Well, I mean, the, you know, if you're a little bit longer in the business already, then obviously, you know, you one thing that should never happen, your mindset should not be stuck at a certain way of making money because yeah. we know how much this changed in the last 30 years just That's in the music point. business. So, like, if you start as a band right now, like, yeah, we want to get number one on Spotify. Yeah, good luck. Look at the check once yeah. this comes. Because yeah, yeah. it's like, it's 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 literally like, if for I look at my ASCAP... For you get like 15 grand for like millions of... Listeners? Oh, yeah, it's like, it's, it's, like it's, it's nonsense. But, and yeah, these are the top artists. You know, yeah. this sounds like a lot of money. And just in radio airplay, this would make yeah, millions. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so you need to always have a creative mindset. So these days, unfortunately, the social media aspect or like the self-promotion becomes by far more, uh, you know, valid or necessary, I should say. Unfortunately, actually. yeah. You unfortunately, have to, yeah. You have to communitize. The, you have to interact, whereas the days of being prince... Mm-hmm. And being but, aloof and, and, you know, you but this to, is for bands basically for, yeah, for whenever the work I did I basically build up my my uh, clientele so to speak over time no, so no, like no. I what yeah, exactly and like I actually you know I always try to d- deliver the best job possible and that basically got me to the point that I got recommended from one to yeah. the other so it was like literally like mouth to mouth like uh, you know promotion that's the yeah. best that can actually happen to you in that sense but uh, obstacles I mean there are a lot out there for instance like if you go like oh damn I would love to make music for this and this and this you know whatever tv show documentaries or whatnot and going through the channels to even get to someone that could even tell you whatnot yeah. that's like a complete different labyrinth again yeah. so it's like there's still a lot of complicated things actually out there in the in in the business so um in that sense that's obviously a little bit the obstacle there you know yeah, so business navigation networking key things for them to mm-hmm. overcome obstacles. I mean, obviously, you used those back in 2004, uh, more important than ever now. Mm-hmm. What's your thoughts, Matt? What, what do you think is... I think for, for a starting musician, the biggest obstacle m- might be the fact that technology and everything is so cheap and you get stuck in your by yourself. Yeah. You know, when Jorg and I were starting, you know, you had to go out and make music with, with people, yeah. right? And that's still really valid. It kind of goes on to the networking and everything else. You, mm-hmm. you really need to get out there and get out of your bedroom. Yeah. So I, I meet a lot of young artists that have, you know, they're... 80% of the way there, they're doing really great stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But they're just kind of stuck by themselves, and we can only do so much by ourselves. So I'd say one of the biggest obstacles is kind of getting over the fact that technology is so cheap and you can do it to, by yourself, but yeah. you might have that ceiling, right? Yeah, yeah. And to kind of get out of your own head and, you know, go, and I know it's, it's hard, right? We're all little kind of introverts, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, to get out there and, and, and meet up and work with other people. I think that's, you know, an obstacle a lot of people have to get over. Yeah, just that, from the start. that, that is because... Inherently, it seems like a lot of really creative artists have a tendency to be introverted. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to make it in this business, that's you could do that before. I guess that's what I was kind of alluding to. If you were super talented and every, you know, and someone recognized that. If you found a champion, yeah. you know, a manager yeah, yeah. or whatever, then yeah. definitely, you know. Yeah, but, but that's nowadays it's not, not quite, the, you know, because there's right. not, not enough back end to mm-hmm. take 10% off of someone's career right, right. now. 
So Especially I, from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I definitely get that. Um, future, what's next with this this industry? What do you think are some of the, the things that we're going to be going to? I was hoping you would tell me that. <laughs> yeah, good point. Well, I mean, overall, uh, I think uh, we're still at a point where content creators still pour more and more money into the business. Yeah. Actually, Apple is right now, or still actually, since the beginning of the year, expanding their uh, uh, employee uh, base in Los Angeles quite drastically, actually. Yeah, that's what I heard uh, over in Culver in, City. Yes, exactly. They rented, I think, the Culver Studios. Yeah. Um, or something like that. Everyone's I think it was the Culver Studios. Nowadays. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. like, you know, I mean, they have cash. They sit on lots of cash. But what they put in there is still actually nothing compared to, to what Netflix puts out every year right now. You don't know when that all that will hit a wall. I'm assuming this at some point will probably like go down again and there will be a consolidation. Because at this point, I think the amount of money that's put into content creation yeah. is like extreme at the moment. And I'm not sure if this will actually get the same amount of money out with the, just from yeah, the yeah. subscription model. So at some point, I think there might be like there might be a but certain I mean, ceiling, and it will be wall. a consolidation and whatnot. But when do we see this? I have no idea. I'm not sitting on the actual you know business end as a you know CFO of whatever yeah, big yeah. company out there. But like um, at the moment, there's lots of opportunities out there. Doesn't necessarily mean that whatever you get placed makes you you know tons of money. But like. The, the more placement you get, obviously, the more money you can uh, take in to eventually advance your career and that, that yeah. kind of thing. But that's what I see on the overall macro level, basically. So Exactly what he said. That's your answer. Uh, yeah, he's obviously <laughs> way smarter than I am. I'm just going to sit back here. And... <laughs> no, but seriously, Matt, you're, because you, you've got, you both have different varied perspectives from where you're coming from, um, especially with sync licensing. Because I mm-hmm. think, and obviously, you do soundtracks you do sound design that's a very specific market and a lot of people are there that are already kind of got a, a you know they usually it seems like at least the, the movie studios go to the same people quite mm-hmm. often we joked around about you know john williams but yeah he had most of the big big hit 70s 80s and that type of thing when it comes down to soundtracks you got danny elfman you've mm-hmm. got uh, hans zimmer you got yeah well one Hans-Zimmer. comment regarding that specifically this is often based on a uh, personal connection yeah, yeah so it's like the very moment you make a good job with somebody that person often likes to come back to you for a job so people want people also, easy to work with yeah right? there's also like a very important uh, thing right there don't be a dick Yes. yes. Very simple. It's a very. <laughs> That's the number one. If you can take away anything from this guy, yeah. don't be a dick. Uh, don't totally. Because, yeah. like, no, it's like this is a smaller business than you would think. It is. Talking bad, uh, bad about people or doing stupid stuff makes the rounds. I've seen this a couple of times yeah. of people and their careers are yeah, absolutely yeah. in the ditch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good connections. That's be it bands or be it like as a composer or yeah. God knows what, you know, because like if you look at Steven Spielberg, that's where you know most of the John Williams uh, projects were Steven Spielberg exactly. or then George Lucas uh, movies, yeah. so all the Star Wars so, stuff. Then they're all very much same circle. Exactly, yeah. and this goes back Danny Elfman and and uh, yeah. Tim Burton, or like you know, there's a various and uh, uh, Christopher Nolan, Hans Zimmer. There's yeah. always like these connections. Once they work out and they work together very well, this continues because the music you know. actually makes the movie. Quite often. So. Th- that definitely can be very helpful, yeah, let's yeah, put it like yeah, that. Yeah. So, yeah, the, c- the personal connections often are, can be very, very exactly. helpful. And I think, especially on the bands or label end, it's obviously a, a connections to music yeah. supervisors and whatnot. If people get along with you, they're way more inclined to actually go like, oh, I really like those guys. Even if the song is maybe a yeah. little bit better, ah, I'll go back to them. This yeah. was so effortless the last mm-hmm. time and whatnot. Yeah, sometimes they're kind of advising check. you. You know, yeah. we've had a, a music soup for, we, we were up for a, the Deadpool, the new Deadpool. Yeah. We had a new, brand new band from New Zealand, and he was trying to place this band. And we didn't have the catalog with them yet. We just did another round of tracks. But, you know, he championed. He loved the band. He loved that they were, you know, they're getting radio play out there. And they just were these surfer guys, you know, that like to make great music. And that, and that's what they're doing. He attached himself to that. And he was really yeah. trying to put that band in that film. And, and I'm sure when we now that we have more tracks, we can go back. And hopefully they'll be placed in, in something Definitely. like that. But So we've got a little bit of time left here. Same question to you, future for sync licensing and the type of uh, focus that you have for the music or audio in the... Yeah. This, is, now, this is, you know, guess, right? Because we don't know, but no magic ball. But I would say that coming from sync licensing end, it's going to be more and more important to get real licenses, you know, that real money licenses to 
be um, participating in social and things like that, where um, you want people to attach to you, feel like they are going to help you out. They're gonna, they're, they're coming upon something new. They can play, you know, radio DJ. I think that's more and more important that you're not just some guy in a bedroom because, like we originally said. There's a million of them, yeah. you know. So being not that person is going to be really important, and being Definitely. a real artist. Definitely, yeah. and don't be a dick. And don't be a dick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Well, hey, Matt Salazar, Nora Cutner, mm-hmm. thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining the Changing Stage show today. Mm-hmm. Thank uh, you, Inner Talk Media. You guys have tremendous careers. I'm looking forward to seeing you do more. Uh, we look forward to having you back again sometime for different types thank of you. panels. Because again, this is all about how this business is changing, uh, where it's going, how it is right now, and, uh, you know, connecting with people mm-hmm. that are making a difference. So thank you, gentlemen. Cool. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're already Matt. You guys, make it happen. Change the stage radio show, TV show, all of that fun stuff. We're out of here.